one of the hottest topics in, uh, in competition law, in European competition law now. It's a, it's a trend that we think has the potential of changing the nature of uh, merger control in Europe because it started uh, through uh, uh, a big movement of opinion on whether uh, thresholds for, for merger findings had to be changed in order to prevent uh, the phenomenon that's known as killer acquisitions. It's, it's led to uh, uh, a choice by the European Commission to change, to use the mechanism of referral as a way to tackle mergers that fall below thresholds uh, when they can pose a threat to competition. And this has created a few distortions in the way uh, that merger control works now because the mechanism of referral was not exactly thought uh, as a way to ensure a systematic control over problematic mergers that fall below thresholds. And now it's, uh, it's become sort of a trend in uh, national jurisdictions that are changing their laws and legislations to make sure uh, that their national competition authorities also have the power to call um, certain mergers for control when they don't have to be notified. And the result of all these movements in, in, in legislation or in changes of policy at the European level is that, of course, the landscape for merger control is changing a lot. Uh, because when a uh, merger uh, actually can be notified, then there is no problem. There is legal certainty. Agreements can be written in a certain way with conditioned precedent mechanisms as we're used to. And there is no problem there. But whenever there's a merger that does not fall be below thresholds, uh, there lies the problem. Uh, because it's not, um, this, this movement is not thought to be something episodic, something sporadic. It's thought to be something more systematic in the way it's been applied. And, and therefore, every time that you cannot benefit from the certainty of having to file a transaction, you have to ask yourself whether you are handling a uh, transaction that can create a potential threat to competition, either at the local level or at the European level. And then you have to devise a strategy of communication with the uh, competition authorities, both at the national level and again at the European level, in order to manage the risk. And, and you have to make choices that are not easy. And also, you have to decide how you want to draft your agreement, which is not, um, there, there is no actually easy solution to propose to a client for this. It's actually something that is really problematic. And it's really problematic, especially now that certain changes have been made and they have consequences. But not all the problems have been rooted out that stem from, from these changes. And there is a lot to be done for the European Commission and for the national competition authorities in order to create a procedural framework that can work, that can somehow replace certain features of the old style uh, merger control system in order to enhance uh, legal certainty, especially, which is the actual victim of all these changes. So what my colleagues are going to do uh, is the following. Uh, Luciana Bellia is going to talk about what is happening at the European level. And a lot of things are happening. Of course, there's been the change of policy. She's going to briefly describe what the European Commission did. Or maybe I'll say a few words if you, if you want me to spare you the task. And uh, then there's the Illumina case which is ongoing right now or with a lot of open fronts, which is very interesting because it's starting to show where the system is shaking and what needs to be fixed. There's the Meta customer case, which is also a variation on the Illumina case, which tells us other th interesting things about the system. Then uh, Natalia Latronico is gonna talk about the changes at the Italian level to new law, 
that imitates what's going on at the European level, but not quite. There are certain differences which are quite striking and which I believe will create a need for fix-ups uh, to be introduced by the National Competition Authority. And Natalia will also deal with the, with the situation in other jurisdictions, which is very interesting, because you, you will see that some, some jurisdictions already had in place this kind of systems for a long time. The thing is, they were not used in a systematic way, the way it seems national competition authorities are envisaging to do now. And so in, in the, the, the parallelism between the Italian system and these other jurisdictions is also interesting because it can teach us a few things on the way forward to solve certain problems. And at the end of this, Matteo will uh, actually raise a few questions with our help, with the help of all the panelists, and we hope that you will have questions that we, that we can answer, uh, maybe issues that we've not spotted. So the issues we have spotted, we will talk about, and the others will leave it to you to, to make this thing through. And um, yeah, so I'll, in, in order to introduce Luciana, what I will say is we, we all know the change that's taking place at the, at the European level, but maybe it's always good to, to recall it so that our discussion will be more productive. Um, the European Commission has changed the use of what was called the Dutch Clause. The Dutch Clause, historically, was the referral mechanism by which member states which did not have uh, merger control legis legislation in place could ask the European Commission to review a merger in their jurisdiction which created threats to competition. It was a way to complete the European um, market system. It was a way to make sure that mergers could be reviewed anyway, anywhere in the European territory without uh, any blank spots. But in, and, and the European Commission has always said that they did not want to enforce this mechanism overly. They did not want to use, they did not want this mechanism to be used whenever um, there was le merger, legi merger control legislation in place whenever a national competition authority had the tools to tackle a merger. Now the European Commission has changed its opinion and it actually encourages uh, member states to refer um, cases that fall below thresholds. And the reason for this is because there is a need to depart from um, the ways of the old merger control to make sure that those transactions, as we all know, that have targets that do not have a turnover, but they nevertheless pose a threat to competition and affect uh, trade between member states, can actually be vetted before they are put in place. The problem with this mechanism is there is no clear procedure. The actual initiative is no longer in the hands of the parties that do the merger because they have no effective means of, of notifying the transaction unless they want to do a voluntary notification which is not envisaged in a lot of, of, of jurisdictions and at the European level. And therefore, it's very difficult to use every time that you have a transaction that can create a threat to competition, you have to decide who you want to tell about, what you're going to tell about uh, this deal, and, and then you, you will have no control over the timings of, of what's going on because uh, it will depend on whether the European Commission thinks that the transaction is interesting and deserves merger control, how it will interact with member states that have to actually request a referral, and then what it will decide, whether it will take up or not the case after the referral is made, and then there will be the normal timing for, for um, the merger control. So that said, uh, I leave it to Luciana and uh, what is left? to what is left. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I did the easy part for you so that you can talk about the more difficult issues. And um, there you go, Luciana. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you. Um, so um, as Marco was saying, there's been this big change that was announced with the guidance paper in March 2021. Uh, and what was the triggering event? The triggering what, what event was the Facebook WhatsApp case. Uh, in 2014, when the Commission realized that uh, 
not all transactions were caught by merger thresholds. Um, so the Commission started questioning whether merger thresholds based on turnover were good to capture all the transactions that could have, be capable of having uh, uh, effects at the EU level. Uh, in fact, the Facebook WhatsApp case was brought by a referral mechanism, it was not a referral under Article 22, the one we're talking about today. It was a referral under Article 4.5, so it was uh, an application of the one-stop shop principle. Uh, because the transaction could be notified in several member states, but the Commission was better placed to, do, to, to examine the merger in that case. Uh, but the Commission started questioning uh, these merger thresholds based on turnover, and they started a survey and investigation, and they realized that there were a number of transactions that could escape the review of the Commission. Most of them involved companies with basically very little turnover or zero turnover, the famous killer acquisition Marco was mentioning before, um, and also examine possible solutions for that, so either changing the merger, the merger thresholds, uh, considering also uh, the value of the transaction, in particular the, the ratio between the value of the transaction and the turnover in the undertaking. The higher the ratio is, the more likely that the turnover is not reflective of the value of the company in terms of competitive importance in the market. Um, so this was the assessment, but ultimately, very likely for uh, an issue of timing, uh, they decided um, to, to follow another approach. Why was that? Because the, the result of the survey was, uh, was the following. Uh, the question, are the thresholds based on turnover good to solve the issue? Yes, generally, but you need to supplement the mechanism with what? With the referral, and that was the important part. You also need to change the commission policy on the referral because only by changing the commission policy and allowing also uh, member states to refer cases below the merger threshold of the national member states, you could actually be able to capture all the transactions that could be problematic. Uh, so the commission issued this guidance paper. It's, uh, it's the one of the few instances in which the commission uh, I issued guidance forward-looking, so to announce a change in policy and not to sum up the previous uh, commission uh, policy. And the reason why they did so, it, it is very likely because they didn't want to go through the legislative process, uh, so they preferred the soft law approach. And, and they announced that before changing the policy because they were aware of the big change for the stakeholders and for all the market and also for national competition authorities to give them time to, to organize themselves in the review. Uh, so this is the background, and Marco already explained why the change has been significant, because uh, uh, Article 22 has been traditionally used very, uh, at a very limited use uh, in the past, uh, even when very few member states had the merger control regime, uh, it was used in very few instances. And um, so this, this was the reason why it was a big change, and the Commission it, they also clarified that in their staff uh, working document add a different approach. Um, so uh, they, they, they changed this approach, they issued this, this, uh, this guidance paper, and then we will talk about uh, the interaction between the timing of the, of the guidance paper and the Illumina case. Um, and what, what, what does this document say? It's, it says that, that there are certain instances in which um, the, the Commission encourages national competition authority to actually apply the case to the Commission when uh, the transactions are below their national thresholds and they satisfy the condition under Article 22. Uh, so the conditions are, uh, they, the, the transaction could be capable of affecting trade between member states and could be capable of uh, affecting competition within the state that is making the referral. Um, so th this is, this is the, these are the conditions, the condition under Article 22 and the Commission also clarified that these risks have to be actual uh, and real. Uh, no, the, the, this is the, what they clarify. And the Commission also clarifies what are the type of transactions that are more likely to be uh, uh, the best candidate for a referral uh, to the Commission. And the first point is exactly what I was mentioning before. Uh, all this is those instances in which the turnover it does not reflect the value of the undertaking target. 
and they also make examples of the type of targets that can be uh, that, that can trigger this this, this situation and are clearly uh, startups or, or new entrants which have not yet reached the agreement or, 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 or companies which have very good products in their pipeline uh, and make a list that would make us and but the, the interesting part is that one of the factors that the Commission would take into account is exactly the ratio between the value of the transaction and, uh, and, the, and the turnover on the undertaking. So instead of, of changing the merger control, instead of changing the, the turnover thresholds, they, they use this as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as one of the parameters to assess whether a referral could be a, 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 a good tool. So this is, this is clear, it's written in, in the paper. And then they also clarified that it goes across all industries, even if um, all their investigations showed that clearly uh, the, the, the transactions that, that were more uh, could it were covered much more uh, about the digital market, the pharma market, but they also mentioned the Green Deal um, and, and other sectors, and they clarified that it is across all industries. In terms of procedure, what Marco was saying is very interesting, and it's uh, the, the difficult part, particularly after the Illumina judgment, um, but uh, uh, they, they encourage uh, stakeholders to go forward the commission and ask uh, whether a certain transaction is actually a good candidate for a referral. Now, this however may not uh, be of any help for, for, for the undertaking because uh, the, the actual timing for the referral, uh, the starting date, is not uh, the communication to the Commission, um, it, but it is actually the communication to the National Competition Authority. So we will go into that later, but uh, the question is, uh, would you communicate that to the Commission only, or would you rather go before any single uh, national competition authorities? And how troublesome that is um, with so many national competition authorities. Um, so this was the, the, the approach of the Commission. And the first case in which the Commission applied this uh, new uh, policy was the now famous Illumina Grail case, which uh, at least Prima facie, it does not look like the best candidate uh, because it's not the case of a killer acquisition. It's a clear case of input foreclosure. Uh, but the case was uh, uh, involved a target that did not have any sale at the EU level, so no, no turnover thresholds could be met at the national level, not, not any threshold could be met at the national level or at the EU level. Um, the case uh, was announced in September 2020 uh, Uh, yes, there's a timeline, uh, which is quite interesting. So the case was announced in September 2020, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Commission stayed silent for, for a few months, uh, while in the meantime the Federal Trade Commission was investigating the, 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 the deal. Um, then the Commission received in December uh, a complaint. And it took uh, 47 days for the Commission to decide that the case deserved uh, a referral. Uh, from national competition authorities, and then asked national competition authorities to refer the case. France was the first, and then other five jurisdictions followed, and, uh, and then the Commission decided uh, to, uh, to take the case uh, and ask the Illumina to notify the deal. And in the meantime, in between the, uh, the request for two member states um, and uh, the decision of the Commission adopted this guidance paper we were mentioning before. Um, this is an important part um, of, of, the, of, of the issue. Um, interesting, since when the National Competition Authority announced that they referred, when they referred the case to the Commission, it's when the standstill obligation apply. Uh, but Illumina nevertheless decided to close the deal, so the Commission started an investigation for gun jumping. Um, and in the meantime, Illumina challenged the decision of the Commission to take the case. Uh, to take jurisdiction over the case. Um, and then the case went, the, the intermissions were, were adopted uh, because, because Illumina closed the deal, nevertheless. Um, and then the battle started <laughs> soon. Uh, I think they, 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 <coughs> then after uh, a few months, uh, a year, uh, we had the judgment from the, from the general court in July. That is very interesting because it clarifies a few things. Uh, the first one, uh, which follow, uh, I would say, normal principle of the General Court and the Court of Justice is what decision can be challenged and a decision to take the case, uh, it's a decision that can be challenged. 
Uh, this is in line with the with previous case law of the Court of Justice stating that decisions that are capable of producing direct effect can be challenged. There have been decisions about in the AXO case about um, the, 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 the decision of the of the Commission upon confidentiality claims. So it's not because it's, a, it's not the final act, but when it's capable of producing effect, it can be challenged. And this is what the General Court confirmed. Uh, but then the General Court rejected all of Illumina cases, and uh, all Ill Illumina uh, pleas, uh, and uh, this is interesting. The first one is about what Marco was discussing. Was the Commission competent under Article 22? Was Article 22 designed to allow situations like this one? Uh, and Article 22, according to the, to the General Court, was indeed capable of covering those situations because Article 22 had been designed for a situation in which merger control regime did not exist. Uh, it's written in a way that would cover a situation in which the National Competition Authority is not competent and, uh, and also has been understood as a flexibility tool because merger thresholds are generally very uh, rigid. So uh, the referral mechanisms, all of them, they've been designed to better allocate competence between the Commission and the Member States, and they can be designed also to uh, uh, increase or, or the, uh, the, the competences of, of, the, of the Commission where need be. Um, so this was the, the approach of the, of the General Court on the first issue. Uh, the, second, the second plea concerned uh, the timing of the intervention was out of what was, was out of date because we have a 15 days period in the, in the Article 22 in the regulation uh, while the deal was announced in September and the referral request only was made uh, many months later. Uh, but the provision says 15 days starting from when the transaction was known. Okay, was known. It's a very complex issue. What does made known means? Uh, a public announcement is sufficient? According to the General Court, the answer is no, it's not sufficient. Um, you need to have a comprehensive set of information. So either you inform, uh, either the, the, the Commission informs the National Competition Authority or the stakeholder, the parties, go and inform the, uh, the, 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 the National Competition Authority. Only then the 15 days period would start running. And this is what makes uh, the old process very complex and very, uh, uh, very, and, and very unclear uh, for the parties, as Marco was mentioning. Um, the last point is on legitimate expectation. Uh, this is very interesting for the Illumina case, maybe less for, uh, in terms of general application, because I think they would, this would really uh, be limited to this case. But no, all the others, I think the policy is now well established, and it's very difficult that someone will going to raise an issue about uh, a legitimate expectation, even if one can just say that the approach was very uh, strict, uh, but is normal with this decision or the judgment of the Court of Justice. So the General Court is in line to take a very strict approach about general uh, legitimate expectation. Uh, so the, the, this was the, the judgment, and uh, after a few months, there was the prohibition decision, and the prohibition decision by the Commission is also very interesting because in the meantime, the the, the proceeding brought in the United States before the court was actually, the deal was approved without, uh, so there is a, there's a, the prohibition decision from the commission on the one end and the approval in the United States. We are not new to that. Uh, everyone remember the point with Nodal, the Douglas case and, and many others. Uh, but it's, it's interesting that the commission um, decided to prohibit the merger with an input foreclosure case because remedies were not considered sufficient uh, even if the set was concerned involved remedies at the upstream level and the, down, and the downstream level. So upstream level were very interesting, uh, but they apparently they did not, it was a, a license of all the technologies of Illumina. Uh, and, and there was also an obligation to stop litigation for approximately three years. Um, and the, uh, the, the well, uh, the downstream remedies uh, were, were also very useful because they, uh, they 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 decided to adopt standard condition and to license all Illumina's technologies under standard condition until 2033. So giving time to Illumina's rivals to to develop their own products as well. Um, yeah, in the F in the US, there is a positive uh, judgment by okay. an FTC judge. Uh, okay. So the process is still ongoing. Uh, but yeah, but they're challenging the FTC. Yeah. Decided to challenge the decision, but um, so um, just just to 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 comment on that, uh, the 
we have a situation in which the Commission has taken this case to change the policy and is not even the strongest case the Commission has ever taken. So it's not only not in line with the, with the initial policy of covering killer acquisition necessarily, uh, but also it's, 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 a, it's a case that creates some issues, at least a divergence between the US and the EU. Uh, so this is very interesting. And then very briefly mentioning there's been another case of referral, the, the, the meta uh, customer case, which however is different, is a more traditional approach because there was a referral from Austria which was component based on the turnover threshold. So there's been a difference in that respect. And the transaction has been clear with condition. Um, uh, but the interesting part there, and then Natalia will cover that, is that Germany has decided not to uh, adhere to the referral, so they, Germany has examined the transaction in, on its own. Um, so I, I, the, the general problem now that we see uh, is that there can be um, many authorities competent to, to review the transaction, but the Commission and the National Competition Authority, because the key principle is that only the National Competition Authority, the, the Commission is entitled to examine the effect of a transaction of only those National Competition Authorities that have referred the case. So in all other jurisdictions, theoretically, National Competition Authorities that have adopted different policies uh, are entitled to, to make a parallel investigation of the effects in their own uh, member state. Um, and Germany is, is a, the Meta Facebook and the, the Meta customer case is, uh, is an example of that. Uh, and this is also interesting under a policy perspective because there could be a situation in which there is a referral from one single member state and the Commission would take the case and then the Commission would examine the effect of a transaction in that single member state. So in that case, uh, is that the Commission the best authority to review the transaction or the national competition authority of that state. But uh, I, I give the word to Natalia. Okay. Thank you, Luciana. Uh, I'm not sure if this is working. Yes, can you hear me? Thank you. So we have a few slides. Luciana, I don't know if you can just. So yes, as Marco was mentioning, um, this trend of uh, introducing rules allowing national competition authorities to review mergers that fall below the thresholds is not an exception. And Italy is a good example of this because um, most recently in August, um, the, the, a, a law came into force, which is our annual competition law for 2021, which amended our national competition law at certain levels including by providing uh, the National Competition Authority, the Italian Competition Authority, with the power to uh, request, in certain cases, notification of mergers that fall below the statutory thresholds, which are well known. We have two turnover thresholds, a combined one, uh, and one which uh, looks at the turnover generated by, at least, uh, by each of at least two of the, um, of the companies involved. Um, so, uh, going, if you can, Luciana, sorry, if you can. If we look, it, I think it's interesting to look at the rationale of these new rules, which was discussed by the Italian Competition Authority itself in a report issued in March 2021 when the proposal for the annual competition law was uh, put forward. Uh, it's interesting because uh, on the one hand, the Italian Competition Authority identifies a rationale which is very similar to the one that prompted the European Commission to issue its new policy, which is to um, be able to strengthen our uh, national uh, merger control regime to capture also transactions that, while raising competition concerns, uh, would escape review uh, because they would not meet the statutory thresholds. So the um, underlying point, the underlying idea is that the current size of companies, uh, which of course is signaled by the turnover they generated during the preceding fiscal year, might not be uh, enough, might not be adequate to really capture the prospective developments of these companies, which is the phenomenon of killer acquisitions that was mentioned before. Um, so on the one hand, the Italian Competition Authority explicitly mentions the, uh, digital, the digital economy and the pharma sectors, as examples of uh, instances in which it might be important to look beyond the statutory thresholds. On the other hand, and I think this is particularly interesting, um, also more traditional industries 
in which there might be um, deals that uh, have an impact, a significant impact at a local geographical level, which means that they might escape the thresholds at a national level, um, might be also good candidates for review, even below our um, turnover threshold system. So uh, if this is a rationale, what are the new rules and what are the open points? Um, I think this is our next slide. So yes, we have three cumulative conditions that must be met for the ICA to request the identification. So the first one is that the transaction either must, um, must meet one of the two turnover thresholds put forward by our law, or the joint uh, turnover um, at a worldwide level of the companies involved must exceed five billion. Then the second one is interesting the way it's worded because it seems like a clear reference to the phenomenon of killer, uh, of killer acquisitions. Because a merger my, my, must raise competition concerns in the national market or in a substantial part of it. Also taking into account possible negative effects on the development of small companies with innovative strategies. So this, I think, is a clear reference to this phenomenon. And then the timing, which is also interesting because the merger has been completed less than six months earlier. If these conditions are met, the ICA may request notification within 30 days. And I will come back to the timing later because I think this is one of the open points that are raising some concerns. So then um, the uh, annual competition law uh, provides for the fines in case of failure to notify mergers below thresholds. These are the same fines provided for um, in usual cases for a failure to notify under our mandatory pre-merger notification system. So under Article 19, Paragraph 2 of our law. And then finally, and this is another interesting point, the uh, annual competition law mandates the ICA to define uh, by resolution, this will probably be, the procedural rules for applying these new provisions. So if this is the law, is the new law, there are many open points, many open issues. The first one that I was mentioning concerns timing. Um, concerns timing because uh, the six month uh, time limit is clearly a very long period of time for companies to reach a legal certainty as to whether the transaction would be or not be examined by the ICA especially if combined with the timing at the EU level, because now we are clear about the fact that um, once the ICA receives a communication of a merger that could be a candidate, it has 15 working days to decide whether to refer to the commission, but then it has six months from the closing to decide whether to review, which is a very, very long time. And also this, this difference does not seem completely reasonable. Also taking into account a scenario in which companies want to be transparent and want to be straightforward, so maybe they might even approach the ICA before the closing, maybe a few months before the closing. Or, or before the or, entering into the agreement. Exactly, or signing. even before the signing, uh, even before signing the relevant agreements, but then still the timing would be six months after the closing. So I think this is one of the instances in which this power that was actually this this, um, this obligation for the ICA to define by resolution the procedural rules for applying the new provisions would be helpful. Uh, so hopefully this is one of the points that might be covered by this guidance and a good solution would be uh, for the ICA to uh, expressly set a reasonable time frame to reach a decision on whether to exercise this power of review or not. And another point, uh, also reflecting on this uh, procedural guidance, could be to uh, regulate more expressly the power of the companies to approach the ICA uh, in advance and to, to try to reach an informal solution through discussions to, uh, to understand whether the ICA is interested in reviewing the transaction. Um, and uh, apart from this, there are other open issues that we might leave for our discussion later. So uh, I would just like to, thank you, Luciana, to um, complete this overview by examining a few examples of other jurisdictions, which uh, explains why, yes, there is an animation that I actually think is going a bit too far. Um, 
a few examples, both in the European economic area and outside the European economic area. A few of this uh, jurisdiction are marked with a question mark because here we don't really have new rules in place, but we have proposals uh, which uh, signal once more how this is a hot topic which is being discussed right now uh, at the national level. So here, instead of really going into the technicalities of each system, I would just like to, um, to draw the attention on a few points on which these jurisdictions differ or um, are similar. First of all, the timing for um, the introduction of these rules. We have some systems, such as Sweden, in which the system uh, is in place uh, uh, since 1997. So for a very long time, there has been a system in place although the National Competition Authority decided to exercise this power to review mergers below thresholds very uh, rarely, only in six cases, which is, I think, particularly interesting compared to um, what are the signals of the new system also. If we look at the speech by uh, Commissioner Vestager that would say that this will not be exercised often, but probably a bit more often than six times in uh, 20 years. Uh, and counting. And um, then we have some systems such as Germany in which, uh, similarly to Italy, the new rules have come into place more recently. This is January 2021. And the system is interesting because um, following a market inquiry by the German Competition Authority, uh, and of course, uh, if certain other conditions are met, which might indicate objectively that there might be a significant detrimental effect on competition uh, stemming from future transactions, um, the German Competition Authority may issue an order, which lasts three years, so a long time, uh, for a company to uh, notify all the future transactions. Um, of course, there are other conditions I was mentioning, so turnover thresholds, market share thresholds, but still is a pervasive power. Um, then another interesting point on which these jurisdictions might be compared is the timing for the review. Uh, while we have jurisdictions such as Norway in which the power to request notification is limited to three months after the closing of a deal, uh, we have other cases such as the United States, which is a unique case. Uh, I would say, I mean, this was said by the OECD, so I guess this might be true. Uh, a unique case in which there is no time limit for the review. So the competent agencies, the FTC and the DOJ, if they um, have indications uh, that a uh, um, transaction might uh, result in a substantial lessening of competition, might uh, intervene without time limits, and this has been done recently in many cases, uh, for acquisition that went back to 10 years before. So very, very pervasive once again. Then the other jurisdiction, I would say they adopt more of a, um, of a medium uh, approach, although it's still quite a long time because both, for instance, both Brazil and Lithuania, it's one year. So here again, I think, although we, we have seen that this power is uh, rarely used, in the end, it really uh, raises uh, the risk for companies and improves legal uncertainty, which is probably not the goal, the ultimate goal for the legislator. So I think I will leave the floor for our discussion. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, so now is the time to uh, raise some complications, right, Matteo? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? So my colleagues uh, have uh, largely cannibalized the time available for my um, uh, last speech, uh, uh, I wanted to raise some questions. Uh, I'll try to anticipate some answers, and then I'm happy to, to hear also from, from you whether you have uh, enlightening uh, comments or suggestions on how to deal with some of these uh, open issues. Uh, the first one is uh, concerns the magnitude and the predictability of the phenomenon of uh, referrals under Article 22 and the request for notifications by the Italian authority based on the new rules. Uh, pending the judgment uh, of the General Court uh, on the uh, um, Article 22 referral decision by the Commission, a high-ranking official of the Commission said, uh, we will take a very proactive stance uh, should the uh, General Court uh, uh, approve, endorse our uh, um, guideline paper on Article 22 referrals. 
We will no longer wait for complaints. We will actively monitor media, publicly available information, mostly in markets in which we are particularly interested, so pharma, uh, the digital space, uh, markets characterized by uh, in innovation, and uh, so we will trigger the bottom. Mm? So we have reasons to believe that in the coming months uh, we will have uh, more or many more cases triggering uh, an article to the referral. Uh, back in September 2020, uh, we heard uh, a different and more encouraging uh, message from uh, the Vice President of the Commission, Ms. Mr. Stagger. At that time, she said, uh, only a handful of mergers each year will be candidate for a referral. Well, this is probably true, but she was referring only to the tip of the iceberg, so probably to cases which will be actually referred and retained as case referred. But there will be many other cases that companies will need to carefully investigate and on which they will decide whether to trigger the interaction with the relevant authority or to remain under the radar because this is the second option. So there will, there will be a lot of work uh, for the companies, uh, for the analytics involved, uh, their in-house uh, and external counsel, because uh, dealing with cases which may potentially be the object of a request for notification by the authority or a referral to the two will be a lot of work. Also because predictability, how predictable is that a case below threshold will be a candidate to an article to referral or to a request for a notification by the authority? In my opinion, very difficult, because in general, when it comes to mergers, the exercise is always a forward-looking, so you have to look at the future, at the short, medium term, and to analyze the, the likely impact of your transaction on the, on the market dynamics. So you have to analyze qualitative and quantitative elements and then you figure out whether, what the likely outcome of this perspective assessment is. But in cases of below the threshold mergers, it may happen that your target has no turnover, so you have no data. To, uh, to, 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 to launch this assessment. So this assessment, which is by definition already quite complex uh, and entails quite sophistication, quite sophisticated economic uh, evaluation and so on, might be even more difficult when it comes to below the threshold mergers. So the answer to my first question, how, how will be the magnitude of the phenomenon and how easy it will be to predict uh, is that uh, the phenomenon could be potentially big uh, and the burden for the companies could be, in my opinion, very high. And this brings me to the third point. What are the options available to, to the relevant uh, uh, companies? In fact, Matteo, if I may interrupt, this is one of the issues that is at the core of the Illumina case. Because in the Illumina case, the competitive analysis is very controversial. Because there are companies that have no presence on the market, the whole assessment is about the potential competitions, competitive strength that can be expressed by the competitors of Grail, which was the target. And we're talking about companies that are developing systems that might become uh, operational in, in 10 years. So yeah. it's, or might never become operational. So uh, it, it, at the time when you have to make the assessment, it's even more complicated. It's complicated now that I've been discussing the case for, for a year or so. So that, is all, that will also be, be very interesting. And there is sort of a suggestion, but it's just a suggestion that the, the, the actual standard for the forward-looking assessment has been a bit lowered precisely for um, transactions that normally would not have been subject to merger control. So. Yeah. That, that, that is kind of uh, yeah. Why is that the guidance paper yeah. stating that there must be a real risk? A very clear cut case, yes. Illumina, Sorry. Yeah, no, yeah, you're fully right, Marco. Illumina is a very good example which uh, uh, provides uh, uh, very uh, interesting uh, 
a close on the, 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 my first two points. The, the, the first one is that uh, it seems to suggest uh, that the bar is very low because uh, if uh, a transaction like Illumina, zero presence, physical presence in Europe, zero turnover in Europe, uh, and the products uh, Illumina is about to launch uh, in three, five years, which are exactly the products uh, uh, in relation to which uh, the Commission has built uh, the theory of uh, import foreclosure uh, are uh, certainly not yet developed uh, and, uh, and in the market. So the bar is, uh, is very low. And predictability also. In the US, so far, so good, and in, in, the new, in the Europe, blocked. So even the two authorities, the most important authorities in the world, has so far adopted different, uh, highly diverging decisions. So predictability will be an issue. What are the options? Uh, the first one, so both uh, the uh, uh, notice on Article 22 referral and uh, the newly enacted Italian uh, rules uh, do not provide for an obligation to interact with the authority. So the first option is to remain under the radar, betting on the low risk of detection and or counting on the possibility in the meantime to build together with your in-house and external counsel a strong case around the absence of the elements which make your transaction a good candidate for a referral or for a request for notification. Uh, I would follow probably this path uh, more uh, uh, in cases uh, which uh, do not trigger a potential Article 22 referral, but cases which are likely to be more local, so cases that might be eventually the object of a request for, uh, information, for notification by the authority, for the simple reason that uh, I would expect these cases to be uh, probably less covered by the media, so less known by the market, uh, less... Uh, less capable of being the object of a complaint. And in any event, in the should, under these circumstances, the client decides to go this way, I would suggest the client in the first six months following uh, closing not to push implementation of the deal too much, because the risk of a referral and of a request by the authority to ask for notification is still there. The second option, which is the one welcomed by the uh, competition uh, authorities, uh, uh, the EU Commission and the Italian authority, is to be very transparent, to be uh, uh, straightforward, to interact uh, with the uh, competent competition authority, but here counting uh, on uh, a procedural uh, 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 scheme that uh, we hope the Italian authority will adopt shortly, providing for very clear deadlines uh, and to create uh, really a forum for a very transparent uh, interaction and also uh, for a very swift uh, reaction uh, by the Italian Competition Authority. Another open point is uh, in, a, in a scenario where uh, we are talking about reportability of below the threshold mergers, so mergers which do not meet the EU and the national thresholds, how do you allocate among uh, competition authorities uh, jurisdiction? Because uh, the uh, turnover criteria, by definition, do not apply. We are below any turnover threshold. So when a below uh, the threshold case uh, uh, should go to the commission and when should it go to the competition authority? Well, in my opinion, the answer is that we should look uh, at the, at the scope of application of uh, the EU and the national uh, measure control uh, regimes. Uh, and it is clear that uh, uh, the EU measure control rule is functional to allow to the Commission to analyze mergers which are capable of having supranational effects, uh, while in the Italian Judicial Authority looks uh, and the national impact, uh, the impact on the transaction in the, in the Italian market or in a substantial part of it. So the answer, in my opinion, should be that the allocation should be based on the uh, geographical potential impact of the transaction, which should be uh, 
uh, the object of a referral so or, or a request. Be left on the member states, on the national okay, because they, if they decide to refer the case, they refer the case. If they decide not to join another referral and to start their own investigation, it will be with the member states. Yeah. They will yeah. have the final word ultimately. Exactly. Uh, then, uh, the, the point regarding the deadline uh, within which the authority should uh, take a decision to request the case has already been covered by, Natal by Natalia. I have uh, a, a, few, uh, a few additional uh, uh, remarks. Uh, this uh, new referral policy in these uh, new rules adopted by the Italian authority has, uh, have also an impact and, in my opinion, a very material one on the work of, of, of our MA corporate colleagues. How could you design the provision of an SPA in which normally you have to identify the list of jurisdictions from which you expect to, uh, to receive clearance? Because normally, so far, when in a system of a bright line uh, merge control threshold test, uh, it was quite easy to intercept the jurisdictions uh, which are relevant uh, for the purposes of uh, identifying uh, the condition precedent of an SPA. But in a system where uh, the reportability of a, of a transaction is uh, is a function, is a largely a function of a decision of a discretional decision of a competition authority, I think this will be extremely difficult. And I don't, do, I, I don't have the answer. Even more difficult to accept provisions which are already very difficult to accept by the purchaser, hell or high water. A provision like this in connection with the deal in which you already know that you will notify in two or three jurisdictions. But in cases where, uh, in addition to the jurisdictions you've already identified, if any, there might be other jurisdictions and you even don't know which ones are these jurisdictions. So the, the risk in accepting such uh, a, a provision is, uh, is really very, very, very high. Uh, a final remark, uh, this is more an, an academic, uh, an academic uh, 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 issue. Looking at these recent developments uh, in the, uh, at the European level uh, on the interpretation, uh, on the creative uh, and forward-looking interpretation of Article 22 referrals and uh, at the uh, newly introduced uh, uh, Italian rules on below the threshold mergers. Is uh, still conceivable a, an already residual application of Article 101 and 102 to mergers uh, which are below thresholds and not the object of a referral request? Nobody told me these two provisions of the treaty cannot be applied, but in my opinion, the scope for such a residual application is now very, very, very residual. Both the authorities, certainly the Commission, and now also uh, the Italian legislator, sent clear messages that uh, when it comes to mergers, uh, there are specific rules uh, uh, governing the review of mergers, uh, which now can be also applied to mergers below thresholds. But these uh, are uh, the, the, the rules uh, that uh, should be applied to a structural phenomenon. And we also have the, a judgment by the Tarlazio. And then we have in this very one. interesting oh. judgment of the Tarlazio uh, concerning an Article 102 uh, case uh, uh, involving a Ticket 1 group uh, in which the Tarlazio clearly, clearly uh, spelled uh, his position saying that uh, uh, concentration shall be dealt with, uh, with uh, uh, merger control rules uh, which have been designed uh, uh, to uh, protect uh, le the legitimate interest uh, of the uh, merging parties, uh, uh, setting forth uh, very clear deadline and time frames uh, for the merger control process. So these were the, my, my few... And uh, if I may, going back to your point, uh, in killer acquisition, maybe it would be appropriate to, to intervene ex ante, but maybe in situations like the Illumina case, there is an input foreclosure case, you can even wait and see whether an actual abuse would take place and, and intervene in that situation. That could also be a solution. So not all 
type of uh, cases should be treated the same way. But uh, okay. Thank you, Matteo. Are there any questions from the floor? I bet you have. Our, our, we are very close to the, of course, to the lunch to, break. To, to yeah, the, the lunch break. But we're and, tough uh, people. We're used to withstanding the pressure. Um, um, I'll no. start with a question. Ah, is is the, there yeah? Is there you go. Can wow. I ask? Wow. Go. You have the first. No, no. Very, very good presentation. Thank you very much for for the in, introducing to this new. Um, issues. Um, y you described, you know, those mergers as uh, killer acquisitions, but in my view, the killer acquisition expression is more used to, to refer to a, um, a theory of arm, where, um, you know, the, the acquirer uh, terminate um, a pipeline product or, uh, or doesn't uh, or terminate an existing service of product uh, that could grow as a, a potential competitor. Whereas uh, we uh, are, you know, the Lumina Grail case is a completely different theory of arm, and but also the, you know, the Facebook uh, Instagram merger that might be uh, triggering this reaction it was also a unilateral effect. Uh, case, if you want. Uh, so Instagram was not killed. Actually, it grew a lot, uh, and m many things that could grow as a competitor, and in instead, it was part of the Facebook company, so there is a unilateral effect uh, that we should consider. Uh, so I, in the Presenting the Italian legislation, you said the second condition clearly identifies the killer acquisition theory of arm. I'm not so sure because they say also, you know, and so they might also include other theories of arm. I don't know whether you agree with this. And a suggestion on your um, procedure point and the time limit concern. Can we introduce or reintroduce comfort letters to you know avoid the uncertainty for the management parties yeah i yeah. agree i agree on all on all these points paolo it's uh, uh it, it is true that in the italian legislation there is this indication particularly for small companies that are particularly innovative and that is an indication that's been given by the legislator but i think whenever the point comes to be constructed by judges, it will be clear that there will be also other kinds of theories of harm allowed to, to trigger the obligation to notify. And certainly comfort letters could be a, a solution here. Clearly, the Italian antitrust authority will have to find a way to commit uh, themselves to statements uh, that they will not pursue uh, a transaction even though they could because the time bar works in this bizarre way that we have seen. Another point that might be interesting, and then we'll take other questions from the floor, but which I wanted to raise, is whether the decision by the Italian Antitrust Authority to actually impose an obligation to notify on the party will, could be appealed uh, before the court. And there, I think the answer is, should be clear. I mean, it's clear to me. It's, it's a decision that creates a, an actual obligation on a party, which is an obligation to notify. So it changes the, 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 the legal status of the addressee, and therefore it should be uh, subject to appeal. No question for me. On the other hand, whether appealing will be useful, it's another story. Because in a sense, once you have a decision that can be appealed and that creates the obligation, you have to appeal it so that you, you leave the question open for the judges to judge whenever you know, the, 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 the hearing on the merits comes our way. But on the other hand, uh, asking for interim measures would be probably counterintuitive because it would just leave the Damocles sword up there for a longer period of time and when the judge, if the judge decides that the appeal was not well grounded, then you will have to, you know, probably it's going to be two years from the merger, and then maybe the, the Italian authority will be able to decide that the merger should not take place, and it's a mess. So you don't want to have that. And on the other hand, you're, it's not sure that there's going to be 
a good reason to pursue the appeal immediately unless you have a very strong case but very clear cut based on a violation of law like uh, like the authority has miscalculated the, uh, the threshold or it's 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 uh, violated the time bar or you have legal grounds like the law is unconstitutional or whatever but there is probably no point in asking the judge to review the merits of the decision of the authority at that stage that is whether the transaction is actually capable of having a significant impact on competition because the administrative proceedings are completely unsuited for that purpose. Because at that point, you would have a preliminary view by the Italian Antitrust Authority. Maybe you can push the judge to push the authority to put more motivation, more grounds into the decision. That would be fine. But then you would have to present your case for the first time before the judge because there will be no administrative proceedings where you actually make a notification and then you discuss the merits of your case with the authority. So, and the judges are normally completely reluctant to look for the first time at legal economic arguments that are made before them. They, they really don't know how to do. Unless, unless, but this is another chapter of our story, unless the, the, the administrative proceedings change and the judges really decide to involve economic experts like Paolo that uh, could, uh, which we will be in favor of. So, so in the end, it would be appealable, but probably the strategy would have to be you just appeal and you leave it there and you see what happens and, and then, and, you, yeah, and then you in case the you, you, you discuss everything at the end of the story if it's gone badly. So it does not really have a, an impact yeah, on what the companies must it's do. It's like a formal requirement that doesn't really make a difference. But do you need to? Probably you will need to, but what that's a... Other thing? questions yeah. from the floor? Yeah. Oh. There, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm from the German Competition Authority, and uh, as you know, Germany is quite uh, critical to the new approach to, to Article 22, so I agree with almost everything you said. Uh, just one uh, small comment. Uh, Luciana, you said, uh, you mentioned the risk of uh, parallel, uh, of parallel uh, reviews. Uh, in member states and at the EU level. And in fact, that was a case in um, Meta Customer. But I think that was a very special case. And uh, it was a very special case because in Germany we could not decide uh, whether we have jurisdiction or not. And if we, therefore, we would re want to refer it or not. The Commission makes very strong, we were under very strong pr pressure of the Commission to avoid, uh, to avoid a situation where the non-stop shop, where, where there is non, no, uh, no one-stop shop. So I think that is a situation that at least the Bundes Kartellamt, but also the uh, European Commission will try to avoid at any cost in the future. For us, it had the advantage, if I may say, that our decision to assert our own jurisdiction is going to, went to court, and we're expecting some guidance from the court to, do, uh, to say that. And um, I have also one question. Uh, here you mention the different, uh, the different uh, national laws, um, giving the possibility to call in cases below the threshold. What do you think is a relationship uh, or the interrelationship with Article 4, 5 uh, of the merger regulation? Could a company that would rather prefer the, to have its case reviewed by the Commission say, well, it is not notifiable in uh, Italy on the old uh, thresholds, but the Italian Competition Authority could, uh, could order a notification. So this is one of the three required mm. national mm. Uh, jurisdiction, mm. and I make an Article 4.5 request. It's a, it's a, a very good question. <laughs> I am afraid I, I don't have a, a, a ready answer. I, think that as far as the Italian legislation is concerned, there would be a weak case for making that argument because the obligation to notify under the Italian legislation only 
um, only comes up with a decision by the Italian antitrust authority. So you cannot say before that that there is a duty to notify and that therefore that could be the third state. Mm -hmm. However, in, in certain national legislation, things might be more unclear and wherever the initiative, like in a voluntary notification system, is left to, uh, to the party, then uh, boundaries might be blurred. It's a good argument, though. I, I think it's one of those arguments that could have, even though might lose on the merits in the end, it might have the merit of raising questions that make the system advance and, and fix some, 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 some parts that do not really work. Another thing that is a, a bit uh, dis dysfunctional in the system is the uh, deciding to whom, who, who to inform and why. Because right now we know the situation is you can ask the European Commission to tell you what they intend to do, uh, but that doesn't create a time bar and uh, so you will have to know to, to inform basically all of the NCAs because it's very difficult to, uh, to make a distinction about which NCA might be interested. Precisely because you don't have, you don't have the benefit of, of, of guidance from the market presence of the parties. So in, in some markets, the impact on competition might be completely potential, but nevertheless be there. Think about uh, uh, blood test for early cancer detection. I mean, how can you say that any country could not be interested by you know, the expansion or the actual presence of the market? So, in the end, uh, there will have, at, 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 as, as things stand, uh, I think we would have to suggest our clients to, every time they do anything, to inform everyone. And that's a bit the solution that I think some some countries are leaning forward, are leaning towards, because uh, like in the German, you know, in, in, the Germ in, in Germany, you have the sector inquiry. At least there is a, a preliminary part where the Bundeskartenamt have to select an industry uh, or certain companies, I think, which will have to notify every single operation. So there's a filter there, or the DMA uh, mechanism, no, in, in, in the DMA, where they will have, you know, there is basically uh, uh, information all over the place that has to be, that is, and this will have to be managed somehow, uh, but I think that's the way to go right now, and it's, it would be very difficult not to, to avoid this if we have to preserve legal certainty. There will be, I'm sure, practical solutions available. We can think of many. Other questions? Uh, they, I, I leave it up to them to decide <laughs> what's that priority. <laughs> Please. Go ahead. Yep. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, I just asked for a confirmation and then uh, a question. So, uh, the notification under uh, 1BIS, so of the Italian law, so the new notification of, uh, that has been introduced, uh, do you consider somehow it as, uh, under Article 1, a prior notification duty or uh, is just a notification uh, of a transaction that has been already completed. In other, in other words, if you complete a transaction, then you receive this uh, request to notify it. You notify it, but the transaction has been completed. What the authority, what can the authority do? Can they, okay, ask you to unwind the transaction, yeah. to yeah. adopt corrective measures, but can they also fine you because you haven't waited for six months uh, before completing? This was the, the, the first question. The last one, is, uh, um, okay, you already said that, that is really ambiguous, this reference to innovative companies, because it doesn't, the, this article, this uh, paragraph doesn't say that uh, the target has to be a small company that has, uh, that adopts innovative strategies. So, is this just, uh, can we read it in this way? So, that uh, I work in a bank, if my bank buys another bank which is not an innovative one, can I be afraid that actually, you know, yeah. The authority is going to ask me to notify because, uh, you know, they are going to use this innovative uh, criterion only to judge, uh, you know, to scrutinize uh, the transaction, or it just applies to the example you were doing about uh, really small innovative companies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I, I may answer on the first? One? Sure. And I would talk about the second then. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it is an hybrid solution because in in Italy it is an exception. You have to file. A, 
a private notification, which means uh, you have to file uh, one minute before uh, close. So in theory, once you file, uh, then you can close. There is no sense in notification. But here, we are talking about uh, the possibility for the Italian authority to ask for a notification within six months for closing. So by definition, the Italian legislator accepts the idea that this notification could be post-closing. So there could be cases in which you ask for a notification, but the merger, which is the object of the filing, has already been closed because the law, as it stands now, does not prevent company from closing the deal. with the yes. decision in which they open a phase two investigation. But they don't have to. They can also not order interim measures and then order a divestiture later on. Now, to your happened. point, and then I don't know what uh, Natalia has to, has to add. Uh, 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 banking sector, as you know, the Italian authority traditionally takes uh, a uh, position on the geographic scope uh, of uh, the relevant markets in the banking sector, which is divergent uh, from the one which is traditionally taken by the Commission, national and local. In the case of a small acquisition, <laughs> this could be an excellent example of a local concentration on which the Italian authority might have an appetite for uh, uh, a for. <laughs> <laughs> And the answer, uh, you still have to answer. No. Yeah, no, 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 actually I agree with Matteo. I, I just wanted to say that the wording of the law in Italian, uh, I agree with you that it's really unclear. Or, and also it looks like an example, yeah. which is provided just to clarify, but it leaves it It looks very like uncertain. Article 102, just yeah, examples, exactly. but then and you, know, you have to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alessandro. Alessandro Nuccio, Italian Competition Authority. No, very easy and very short question. I mean, you haven't covered in a, in a very deep way the role of complaints in this, because in, in my experience, which is very long, unfortunately, the, the, the main source of information about this sort of mergers comes from complaints. complaints. Because either you follow all the press release which come out about mergers, which is impossible, or you don't have information about what's going on under the, under the thresholds. So the, the, in, in my opinion, also in this new legal setting, the trigger point, uh, which in some way is also able to, to focus on, on some effect, is that someone is complaining about the merger. And uh, I do think that also in the future we are going to use this power, especially in the case in when, when someone is complaining. Yeah, which makes the system more unpredictable. Even I and, know, and, and on the other hand, would you be willing, I mean, do you think that an authority would be willing to commit themselves no. to a deadline after receiving a complaint? Which was the problem in the Illumina case. I think that the time bar any sort of time bar should always follow the initiative of the parties. But, but you are right. Uh, the complaint is one of the, uh, the elements that you, know, you cannot govern at all. And, and it makes a difference. I agree. I, I mean, I, I, I cannot <laughs> disagree so, at all. <laughs> honestly, to detect uh, uh, um, through publicly available information uh, deals uh, which are even below the Italian thresholds uh, I think uh, it won't be a very easy exercise. Eh? So, oh. Unless you really touch upon uh, a small uh, player uh, which is extremely innov innovative, very known in the specific market in which uh, it is likely or willing to operate uh, in the future. So it won't be very easy for Our local market vendettas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but Alessandro, you, you wanted to ask something. Thank you. Alessandro Greco, Edesh Sutherland. I think another source of information, uh, although the legislation are completely different and the rationale are different, is the foreign direct investment uh, legislation. Because I, as we all know, there will be uh, an interplay to a certain extent. Uh, we know that uh, a number of transactions below the thresholds are nowadays uh, notified, at least in Italy, because there is a broad interpretation of the requirement for the FDI. 
So actually, uh, I wonder in all those cases, we, in any case there is a, an FDI uh, filing, uh, uh, I only see the option of having, of having a proactive approach with the competition authority, uh, of course, to seek guidance uh, and clarity for both reasons. I mean, for an Article 22 referral, possibly, and for uh, uh, a request by the competition authority to notify a transaction under the new rules of the annual competition bill. Although the legal basis is very different, so I mean, you would do that only if you see that there is an actual risk that the case is a good candidate. Otherwise, it's not that you're going to inform the National Competition Authority any time you do a, 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 for FDI notification, because then the Competition Authority will kill us. <laughs> or kill themselves. Yes. But yeah, another thing that, that would be very important, we, we just discussed it with Paolo before our session, but we didn't say it for everyone, is uh, opinions about the competitive risk of a transaction could become crucial. Before doing the agreement, before deciding however you want to handle the, 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 the filing process, uh, probably you will want to ask your clients to request an economic expert to give an assessment as to whether uh, this transaction is a candidate or is, is dangerous in any way. So having, uh, I think that could become uh, standard practice, and at least, at least when some money is involved in the Although, as Matteo was saying, it's a very complicated assessment in this case. Yeah, but mm -hmm. economists have their ways, <laughs> you know, because they're the same ones that yeah, actually advise. Good one. They're they the same, manage, they're they the same ones that actually advise <laughs> the enforcers, so they will have to know at some point, right? All right, other questions? Please. Then, Paolo, you, it's, it's the last one. No more questions. So you have, you have the whole the Thank you. Sorry, just the last the final question. My name is Justine. Probably a, a, a oh. good source of information uh, is, uh, is the one which is currently the object of a quite interesting debate at the European Union level, the interplay between uh, the, D, the DMA, DMA uh, yeah. notification obligations, uh, and uh, the capability for the Commission to gather information. So Article 14 and 15 uh, of the DMA yeah. uh, provide for a, a, a duty to, no, to yeah, notify. Exactly. Yeah. So tell me everything. This is my good, a good channel of information that might help. Last question. Actually, a follow-up question to the Italian Competition Authority. My name is Justin. I'm from Norway. Thank you for a very interesting discussion. Uh, so we've been through this for 20 years, I think, this discussion. But uh, you said complaints, and that concerns me uh, a little bit because complaints, they come from competitors uh, often. And when competitors are concerned by a transaction, it might be because they are sort of getting more competition. Do you, uh, what kind of complaints do you rely on when you sort of start taking up a complaint? That concerns me a bit. Thank you. This is a question for the Italian Antitrust Authority, though. I, he said it. I don't, I don't have to answer that. My answer would be very clear. <laughs> no, but, but he doesn't have a microphone. You want to answer, Alessandro? Or? The answer is depending on which side are you on. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. I, mean, I, I assume uh, and I know for a fact that there is a filter on, on complaints. Uh, but, but the system remains unpredictable exactly for, for that reason. I mean. The authorities might see it right 90% of the times, 95% of the times, I don't know, but there will always be some complaint that can get through and that creates a case that maybe does not have too much merit. But it's, it's, uh, it, it's true that you, you know, complaints signal to you that there is some turmoil, that there is something going on and they make, can make you see issues that otherwise you wouldn't think about. But I take your point uh, wholeheartedly. So, uh, I guess that that's it. Thank you, everyone, for staying with us. Thank you. And uh, enjoy lunch and the uh, continuation of the festival. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Carlo Alessandro. Ma vedete che la tra voi autorità nazionali, queste beghe non ci sono. Grazie. Grazie. Tu, eh, Natalia, tu la conoscevi l'Italia? La conoscevo, però non volevo. Natalia lavora con me a Milano. Molto piacere.
Ciao. 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 Ciao.